So kia ora koutou, uh, welcome to our Plant Lab series. I'm Dr. Maggie Buxton, and today I'm introducing you to Raywin Turner and Brian Harris, uh, New Zealand's foremost transdisciplinary practitioners. Uh, I've known Raywin now for a number of years, and she was part of the very, very beginning of Afi World when it was still a project in South Auckland. So I'm very excited to talk to you now, uh, too many years later, Raywin. Um, and have you present uh, with your partner in crime, uh, partner in work and partner in life, Brian, um, some of your amazing mahi that you do. Um, everybody who's listening, uh, this series is supported by Zoom webinars. They are our sponsor. And uh, Plant Lab is very kindly supported by the Ministry of Culture and Heritage Project, uh, the COVID Recovery Fund. So um, again, welcome to both of you. What I'm hoping to do is, is to turn it over to you to uh, present a little bit about yourselves and introduce your work and background, um, and then say a little bit about some of the projects you're doing to inspire practitioners in Titai Tokoro who are interested in um, what you do and, and how they might go about doing it. So if I can turn it over to you, Raywin, to share screen and go from there. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for um, inviting us to talk about our work, Mag Maggie. And here we go. Oh, that's over to you, Brian. Oh well, I <laughs> I didn't expect to start, but I'm going to uh, Brian Harris, and I've been in the film industry, and I make gadgets like that for cameras and things, and um, I've been doing it for a long time. And yeah. maybe there's what there, sort of gadgets are get, Oh, that's just a that one before was a you put a camera on and it stabilizes it when it's moving around so you can zoom in without it shaking and rattling. There's the same thing. Not just that though. And there's a there's a robot. See, that's a fast robot that whips the camera in on something and pans and tilts. And I've got a workshop and I make things. This is something that I made with Raven, this um curvy thing. And that's another thing. And that's what we started this project here in Poland where we shine a light through the reeds. And the reeds interrupt the light and generate a pattern which a computer, <coughs> pardon me, a computer analyzes <coughs> and pulls letters out of. And here's Raven. That was a quick intro. Uh, uh, Brian does a lot more than that. He he also uh, he also program. He he builds and programs computers, as well as um, works with um, making robots and um, things that actually work. And silently, as you know, for for the film industry, it can't make a massive noise. Um, and um, so. I'm working with smell, uh, both um, from the point of view of the way we smell, like in our noses, you know, um, what the olfactory system does and making materials for that, as well as the way that we smell as humans um, and, and the smells that we give out and the ones that we're not conscious of. And I work with painting and video performance and installation. And part of the um, thing of smell is materials, working with the materials with your own hands and, and making some of the materials. So um, on um, the, the picture with the rose petals, I'm, I'm using enfleurage, which is a very old technique of setting the petals every single day in, into fat and, um, and then they're pressed together and then they're changed the next day. And that um, um, happens over about oh, 10 days to about two weeks of changing the petals. And that means that you've got to have enough roses that, that um, are continuously growing. And the other picture is um, distillation where, where I grow plants like, for example, um, lemon verbena and distill it, steam distill it and make hydrosols and um, then then I can put all of and oh and I do rosemary and various other things orange blossom 
and so on. Um, and then I put them together to make, for example, smells from the backyard um, or various concoctions. Um, and I also paint, so that's one of my paintings. And I also worked with split ends, and that gave me an intro into discovering my own synesthesia. Um, and on the right here is um, is a book. I don't know if you can see that, which was produced. Um, um, I was one of the synesthetes um, that were interviewed for that book, 25 synesthetes, I think, and artists and scientists from around the world. And um, um, so, and I've been working with synesthesia for a long time, but while I was doing um, lighting for split ends for, and set design for working with them in collaboration with them for about eight years, um, straight after art school, um, I um, was um, with um, my lighting, I discovered that that um, I I had a, um, a synesthetic response of color to the music, and so I used to try and um, with with the colored light um, um, be guided by my my synesthetic response, and I would copy what I saw in my mind's eye and felt. And um, and so I have um, since used um, my synesthesia and and smell and 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 also um, mapping other projects, other other art. Um, so and yeah, and painting as well. So I've continued to paint. Painting's one of my core. It's actually my core practice: painting and drawing. And this is a synesthetic project. It's um, um, four senses concerts for the deaf, and um, it's translating music into colored light and smell for um, with a uh, with symphony orchestra music for um, um, concerts for ev every ability. So. Um, um, we I called it concerts for the deaf, but that was just the beginning of it. It was also blind and disabled people in, in the audience. And um, we also provided um, vibrating cushions, you know, from, from um, like boom boxes for some of the audience and balloons. And also um, um, the hands, which were um, the, the steining choir for um, deaf audiences. Um, yeah, so um, this this is a little tiny, this one was in collaboration with Tony Brooks. So there's lots of stuff, and <laughs> I'll go through it quickly so you can yeah. see the coloury stuff. Well, there's quite a lot going on there. Yeah, atom bomb explosion. <laughs> so, so we had cameras amongst um, Tony Brooks translated um, the the movement of playing the sound into coloured light, and and I translated. Oops. the music into into um, colored light and smell. Yeah. And then we put them together um, in the collaboration. Um, and also, um, as oh, um, I've got four children, and so in Melbourne, I had a, have had a group called Bad Mothers. Um, and uh, this is recently published in a book by Anne Marsh called Doing Feminism. Um, and um, we were um, saying that um, um, mothers had, um, well, women have a different way of working in, in art practice. 
and and we continued our art practice right through having having our children, but we exhibited it in a different way, and um, and it was basically to help us to continue our art practice by grouping together and showing in in group shows rather than solo shows, even though we were still having some solo shows, um, but uh, and we're still going as well, even though our children have grown up and are adults now. Um, and the other one is protest work with Fiona Clark, and that's us uh, protesting outside the Len Lai Centre. Um, and um, because the Len Lai Centre is, is known to be receiving um, big oil funding and fossil fuel funding, and um, and um, the fossil fuel people are fracking all over New Plymouth. And we don't think it's right that a gallery should be receiving that sort of funding. And also that they put up a shiny edifice so that we can't crit criticize them as artists. Um, so so um, and Fiona and I have performed in several works here before. Over a long period. Over a long period of time since art school days, yeah. Um, and my art school days at Elam were um, 72 through 75, yeah, so four years. And this is our first work. Um, first work we that, did together. Yeah. Cake making. <laughs> yeah, we, we, this was at um, the SCANS um, yeah. residency. And um, um, it was about the monocultures of um, rice, wheat, corn, and soy. And we tried to make something from just those ingredients and flavor them with synthetic flavors um, and, um, and um, unmatched colors. So, but we did other things. We made pies. Oh, yeah. We, we started out making a lot of pies out of those ingredients. And they were very fancy and gilded, but but it didn't really say what we wanted it to do. Um, and it was a it was really talking about how how we can have those uh, monocultures and um and flavor them in many, many different flavors. Um, like almost like a million colors. There's a million flavors, and and they're synthetic. And actually, then when we tried the real flavors compared to the to the synthetic flavors, the synthetic flavors gave you much more of an idea of what they were than what the natural flavors um, gave you, like a peach. And a synthetic flavor was definitely a peach, whereas the peach pay the natural peach really paled in comparison. Mm. Um, yeah, so that yeah, was our did, first experiment. Yeah, <laughs> and we did a, the research we did before we made that one in Auckland was we went to this vegetarian restaurant where they have these um, tofu that are flavored artificially oh, yeah. to, yeah. to um, pretend to be other things like chickens. And we had a yeah. We sampled that. It was dreadful. <laughs> um, but we made yeah. a lot of stuff out of tofu, soy yeah. beans. Yeah, so food that's made to look like something mm -hmm. else or tastes like something else. But nobody was, everybody was hoping for a banquet at the end, but yeah. it, was, it wasn't edible. <laughs> Everything we made was kind of unedible, but we cooked and cooked. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and, um, and then um, I got a residency with the Manel Chemical Senses Center for Taste and Smell and in America in Philadelphia. And um and Brian was saying, you know, what what would you, you know, what sort of things could we make for that? And I said, could could I asked Brian, could you make um something that draws in smell that that um, breathes in smell and outputs it as sound and and um, another thing that will express sm smell 
And um, so we took this to, I, I took this to um, Monel and tested it out with this in the science labs in all different ways and presented it to the scientists. It sounds dreadful. Oh, yeah, the sound's not... The strain derived from the B6 or the C57, uh, they're just slightly it's different. It's going to be a I don't know if this is okay to join the scientists. Oh, yeah. But um, the idea was that this, the volatile parts of the volatile gases get drawn into this through the tunnel, and there were three sensors that picked up roughly what they were. They were more sensitive to some things than others. But let's stop it, it's a sound awful. There's been, there's nothing different one. So which one is that? One um, from the B6. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, it was it was really good um, having it at the science lab um, and and working with the scientists in different ways. And, um, and we'll come to this. I also took the smell expression one as well um, because they, um, they have both of those kind of... Um, they, they have both of those sort of devices, but not like that in, in their laboratories that they use to um, um, on, on both um, rodents and um, test subjects, humans. Yeah, um, but definitely not in that way. They, have, uh, and they do it in a different way. Um, so um, we did use... Um, that um, smell to sound instrument in in the this next project, and we um, we've performed this several times. I performed this before I met Brian, and then we developed it further, um, and that's mapping emotional words to fragrances and flavors, and um, and then um, um, sampling the map the mapped um, flavors and fragrances as a wine tasting, as an actual wine tasting. Um, so uh, this one is in, uh, we gave the workshop in it was a, um, Italy. Italy, yeah, Mat 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 Matriata Feltria. And, and um, the other one is in Brighton. Um, yeah, so, and the next one. And this is um, where this is in Italy, where Brian was um, using the smell to sound machine. Um, uh, we, we tried it on a beetle. Sorry. Yeah, a little a little blue beetle. <laughs> that everyone went out and collected. The sound of beetles. That's the concentration of gas concentration. Yeah. Three gas sensors. Okay. And they run they, 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 the 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 output choosing the piano. Then on the stress they they make extra smell, so that's the sound of the big ones, didn't it? Yeah. Classical, you know. Very rich. Yeah. But Brian was was basically testing that out, um, testing out the the um, concoctions that people made, <clears throat> mapping their emotional words to fragrances and flavors. And we also had were gifted a lot of um, people went out and gathered a lot of plants from the environment. I should go just go back to this. Um, um, the or the um, the participants went out and gathered heaps of plants and flowers and everything from all around the district um, in, in a group and, and also they brought stuff to it. And, um, and then um, we had um, scientists and, and um, um, but, um, botanists who identified all the plants and, um, and then, because we didn't want to poison anybody, but that was pretty interesting too, because because there were um, many that they gathered. And um, and then we also had a whole range of synthetic flavors um, from sentient 
who also gave us things like mouth mouth feel flavors and um, 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 capsaicin and you know very hot flavors as well. Um, and so so they were all the things that we spiked the wines with. Um, according to whatever matched emotionally to the words. And we also used that smell to sound machine in, in this work, which is called Fallible, um, which was also an installation. Oh, what happened? <laughs> Not. No, it played for a while. I'll move it on just a bit. So the flowers rotated yeah. over a vase that held the smell to sound machine. Mm. And they were unscented flowers, but their VOCs, the volatile organic compounds, were being picked up by the sensors, by the gas sensors. Yeah, so that's <clears throat> and then the um, was also this was filmed inside the house, and the background was put in later by trickery. That one's trickery. Yeah. So Raven took us to Spain. Yeah, yeah as an installation, and we've also shown it in. Um, in Australia. Okay, so the bunch of flowers was pretty tricky to arrange because they're sideways. Mm. Um, so I had to learn flower arrangement, which my sister helped with, which was great. And the florist down the road gave me loads of flowers to. Um, to um, practice with and and so that you know so you're always sort of crossing disciplines and and you know trying to sort of how do you make the work and quite often you have to go into different different areas to find you know how how to do this and yeah and the way it worked uh, the electronics was um, the same old thing it had a gas sensor which is a tiny bead ceramic bead that's got a coating on it and it's got a little tiny heater inside it and um, when gas molecules land on it they change its conductivity which produces a voltage that changes according to the smell and that goes into an Arduino in this case which measures the voltage and turns it into a digital thing and that gets um, fiddled around with and sent off to a synthesizer chip that plays piano notes. Also, because it was so ephemeral, it would only last while the flowers lasted, which was about I mean, three days. So that's why we decided to make a film of it. Um, and then prints. Good bus. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so this brings us to our other work, which... Um, this was the smell um, expression work, um, and you could talk about that. This oh, is... All these wavy these things here, these all, wait, is there another picture further on? Yeah. These yeah, things right. here, they move in and out, and, they, and as they collapse, they squirt out a squirt out smell. No. And there's inside these things, inside each of them, there's a little box with a certain type of smell in a fan, and these things they sort of uh, attract, they attract you and flavors you. But so you go, when you get really close, they suddenly go, of course, and split you, split the smell. But, um, so, so yes, the, 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 the lamp stays um, the bellows. Inside there, a box full of 
Can you speak up a little bit, both of you, if that's all right, just a little bit clearer? Yes, um, I use the, um, um, the information that I gleaned from Monell and working with scientists to um, find out about anosmia because uh, the goal is to smell climate change in the air and um, then but we have to figure out what we can smell and what we can't smell first of all and um, um, so um, I started with what we may or may not be able to smell and there there's about 20 compounds um, that um, uh, people may or may not be able to smell that are known as anosmic compounds and also some of them will smell differently to some people but they are more like fugitive compounds um, but I did talk with the scientists a lot and you know to find out the, to do the research on it um, and there was also the smell of home so um, I, I um, surrounded that with um, backdrops of um, what's that tar called? Uh, uh, Stockholm tar. Stockholm tar yeah. painted on on um, plastic because that's the smell of home with our hydrocarbons, the hydrocarbon backdrop, and um, and the smell of home is something that you don't really realise is there until you go into a different. Um, go to a different country and then you miss it mm. and that was one of the things that um, really brought the smell of home back to me because I was in Philadelphia yawning and and I realized that um, I, I missed the smell of home a lot mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah I used it as, as the, a metaphorical backdrop yeah and these things here, these, these yeah, this are, is twenty of there's, them. There's, yeah. there, there's an arm that connects inside the puffer. This is it's using, well, radio control servos basically, and a, a proximity sensor. And so the thing was pre-programmed to do, to to when nobody was around, it would be latent. And then when somebody came within range, it was that sort of trying to get them uh, get their attention. And then as it got closer and closer, it was sort of it was all programmed. Uh, when they got closer and closer, it collapsed the puffer and blew the mm. smell out. But that's the mechanism. So that's just radio control servos, um, distance sensors, Arduinos, and um, that's all those thought. The, all the stuff it's that we do is really Arduino, yeah. it's really simple. We usually yeah. use Arduinos or something something of that sort, you know, because the convenience of being able to buy the microcontroller already on a circuit board and mm. AliExpress is our friend. <laughs> um, and we showed this in ICEA in Sydney and we're, we will be showing this in um, um, Te Awaha Nui Stroom in Hoxton in February. It'll be installed there. Yeah. Um, also, to enhance people's um, um, sense of smell are sugar dispensers, um, because that enhances the sense of smell, um, according to the Monell Laboratory. The scientists said if you have a bit of sugar, so we made sh special sugar dispensers. By like putting salt on your food. <laughs> yeah, it is, eh? Hey? That's a very... And so here they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this oh. is a different work altogether. So what happened is there were the, during the earthquakes in Christchurch, they somebody mentioned um, a large electrical or magnetic disturbances, and I thought, oh, crushing rocks maybe is what it is, and so we got a rock and we crushed it put some electrodes on and there was a voltage was generated a small voltage so we thought i oh, will make a thing that you push down on the lever and it catch captures the voltage and does something mm. and so we made that 
And then, unfortunately, after a few weeks, it stopped producing any voltage. The rock had had enough, I think, so we had to change it slightly to respond just to pressure. And when it goes, that stone on the end there rattles. The little stone there rattles about crushing smell beads, releasing a smell. Yeah. So the smell is um, petrichor, which is um, w um, the smell that um, the rocks and the soil give out. Well, it's actually bacteria um, that they, they, they give out after the after the rain. Yeah, and it was known as the the um, smell of rocks, uh, smell of the earth. Um, mm. And also, this was exhibited in Los Angeles in Sinister. Um, uh, what color is what color is blue? No, what taste does? Oh, sorry, what what taste is the color blue? And um, it's a, it was a synesthesia exhibition in um, Los Angeles. Um, but the, the dolorimeter. Um, um, was uh, also inspired, you know, not only by the rock. And we, we did go to a lot of rock places to look at rocks and sample rocks and crystals, and it, we, it mm. took us down a whole path of rocks. And, um, um, but, but about the pain, the pain meter, um, and, and whether you can sense somebody else's pain or not, and um, how much, how much the dolorimeter was um, created um, as a way of, of trying to ob objectify pain, which is very subjective and very different for many, many people. But it, it um, gave a pressure um, that could possibly be rated. But after, after um, it was used um, for quite a long time during the 1940s and 50s and 60s, um, it was decided that actually pain was so subjective that it can't be measured. However, we can feel other people's pain, which is, um, you know, if you see if you see somebody else in pain, often you will feel it yourself in your own body. Um, and that's Brian. That's a picture of Brian using a screwdriver. I think. No, what was that? Well, that's little, that's underneath. That underneath. Yeah, this is yet another Arduino-driven thing. It's so I've got a a thing called a load cell which measures weight, turns weight into electricity, electrical signal, and that runs a solenoid. A little solenoid that taps away on the little rod there, and eventually, if you push down the right amount, it resonates and starts flinging this. Smell bees all over the place. <laughs> it makes it tremble. Mm. Yeah, it makes the little stone tremble in the dish, and 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 therefore, um, it it um agitates the beads and releases the smell. It's very heavy as well. It's really heavy. Yeah. Of steel. Yeah, and it's got those um, little feet on it. Oh, that was to to make it less susceptible to tipping over with. By spreading them out of it. It's spreading the weight. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so this this thing here, this is a um, it's a wild animal, and 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 you're and it's got an arm on it which ruffles the fur, and, and people who don't like ruffled fur tend want to stroke it and pat it, and if you stroke it and pat it for a little while, it starts to purr, and then if you and if you keep on going. It'll purr very violently and blow a s animal smell out at you, <laughs> and then it'll then it'll settle down and rough and and um, ruffle the fur for the next person. And it's also driven by an Arduino and a, I think a proximity sensor and a motor, step motor, mm. planetary gearbox to drive the arm, and that was. We made a few of those that went to Australia. They were in Australia in an exhibition called, what was it? The Big The Big Anxiety, the big anxiety, big anxiety Festival, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. Um, so, so um, um, rubbing the fur up the wrong way 
um, um, it, it seems to automatically um, compel people to smooth it down again. And so I was thinking that 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 was um, one of the tasks in, in training in training people into um, empathy, you know, smoothing things down. And um, um, because um, I got really fascinated with um, the rat training in, in Manal and how did they know what to do in a very short space of time, you know, that would humans know what to do? In, in a space at where there weren't any instructions. Um, and then I found out that, that the rats are actually um, water deprived, which, which really motivates them. And, um, and then they are given a nice smell when they do the right thing. And then, then, they, then they know that they're doing the right thing, so therefore water might be available. But it's you know this this kind of training of the human into empathy by smoothing it down. We don't know what comes next, but if you just sort of like practice smoothing rough you know fur that's rubbed up the wrong way, um, it might do something. <laughs> yeah. And here it is. Yes, they're smoothing it down. <laughs> So it was unprompted. Yeah, unprompted. There's no sign. No. We had to have a we had to have a fur ball on the end of it because it was health and safety. Yeah, health and safety. So nobody would get stuck with the aerial. <laughs> Should we go down. Um so um, <clears throat> airborne particles, back to the airborne particles again. And um, we went to um, do a residency at CENT, CENT uh, the Centre for Environmental Investigation of um, Nanotechnologies. Um, and that, that was in um, Northern Carolina. Um, Dur Durham? Durham. Durham, yeah, D at Durham University. No, Duke University. Duke. Duke. Yeah, Duke. Duke University, and um, and we um, looked in the scientists' drawer and through their telescopes, and they had yeah. lots of talks with them, and went into their environment to see what they were finding out about nanotechnologies. But we saw nanoparticles with the naked eye. That was the amazing thing. Yeah, yeah. You can see them moving. Yeah. Cascading. So, from that. Um, we made a project with scientist Tony Frolick in um, Switzerland, um, who is a um, nanoscientist. And um, we made lots of art experiments, and he, he um, fed us lots of um, science papers rather than us going and working in the laboratories together. Because he was um, in a different country. Yeah, yeah, he's in a different country, and um, uh, so uh, Brian made this foam robot. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, first of all, this is shaving foam, and it's got ti um, nanoscale titanium in it, and um, um, so we focused our um, attention on personal care products that had nanotechnology in them. Because there is evidence that the that um, humans are consuming um, nanotechnologies and they are migrating into the the brain and the central nervous system and the hearts and lungs, and and so um, this is the robot that Brian made with shaving foam. Yeah, so I don't think there were any Arduinos in that one. No, what, what, what was it? Um, we had to try out a lot of foam. Yeah, I can tell anybody who's interested the best one. Yeah. I'm sorry, I use yeah, yeah. myself now. But, but there weren't 
um, we, we had to have the one with the nanos in it. But this is but, what this is all about, though. Mm. Is, is to, it was to generate shapes that were, because later on we made this time lapse thing. Yeah, I've got to say that. Oh, yeah. 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 But anyway, that's how it works. It drives around. You pre program the trajectory and let it go. And what and there's we... a wee solenoid valve that releases the stuff. Um, there's an XY cable and there's an up and down. And so you get all these sort of shapes. Beautiful shapes. And and so what, what the shapes do is that they make us see figures and faces and cities and all sorts of stuff. And and in that way it's a, it's a kind of a synesthesia as well. Mm -hmm. but, um because we're seeing we're seeing um, shapes and meaning in inanimate objects. Oh, come to a sticky eye. So here's the video. Mm. So I scripted the sound. Um, every expression in the face had a note, um, and then I. Um, my son Harley Rayner, he he um played and recorded it. But what's going on here is a time lapse of these foam faces that are stuck on a piece of potato. And as they slowly as the foam collapses, they go from old to young. We stuck them on potato because the um, potato and the human brain have um, a molecular convergence. They, the um, mitochondria in the potato and the human brain are very similar. Um, also, the words are from um, Plato's recording of Socrates' dialogues, dialogues on friendship. And the the because nanotechnologies are very sticky and they cling to each other and they cling to other things you know they they um practice convergence they were all grouped together in the body um and other places and um so it's the di the the dialogues are about um the influence of friends on and you know uh, uh, how friends influence each other for asking questions about how they influence each other. We should go to the beginning of this because it, it's sort of like the beginning of sort of where you can see the face. The face is changing. Changing, yeah. Because it doesn't change much. Of quality. Anyway, that was the the thing that we discovered. Because how we sort of work is we have these ideas, or mm. Raven might have an idea. Uh, which we won't describe. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think, oh, we could try it out using, we could try it out with this because I can do that sort of thing. And Brian made And then we make something and then we have a look and go, oh, this is actually good. Let's proceed yeah. a bit further. With this. So, so Brian, this this is over about three days. Um, e you know, each take we did was about three days long. So Brian made a, what is it, an interview? Into the long. Into the long. Yeah. Just, just turn the camera yeah. on. Yeah. At the right, at the sort of time. But anyway, there's the potato and the yeah. human brain was a pretty amazing part. Yeah, and so um, we've just recently, um, Tony and I have just recently um, written another paper that since we started this in 2017. Um, we have found that indeed uh, there's a lot more research now, and that um, nano nanotechnology is is um, accumulating in humans, and actually iron oxide um, is accumulating in the in the brains and the hearts and the and the um, nervous systems of of city dwellers, um, and it is producing um, Alzheimer's. And what we're saying is that it could produce a, an acquired synesthesia. Yeah.
So uh, this next one is lacuna, which is beeswax. And beeswax melts at about 45 degrees. It's got a sensor in it, which you can see down the bottom picture. And um, when um, the indoor temperature gets to 45 degrees during climate change, um, it will start a sound. Because when it gets to 45 degrees, it's all over in indoor temperature. And so these were designed originally to be worn on the head like a halo. And the other thing that would happen if it got really hot is they'd fall down over your head and probably stop you breathing. Yeah. Anyway, the, yeah. that's the sound. Anyway, so, so the sound is coming from, you want to talk about, uh, that's oh, well, a, 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 a microphone. It, because they had to be, they couldn't be running all the time, it had to turn on, so there's a temperature sensitive switch. There's an MP3 player with a little amplifier and a battery and a speaker out of a uh, an iPhone speaker or a MacBook Pro or some sort of speaker. Like the sound is already compact. And the the little button there, which is like a little nipple, um, you press that just to sample the sound because you're not going to hear it until it gets to forty five degrees. Mm. Um, but and the sound um, we recorded a, a baby crying and um, um, and then slowed it down so it goes from it's just simply slowed down from baby to child to adult and then it turns into an animal a wild, sound, animal. A wild yeah. animal sound hmm. here it goes Simply slowed down. It's horrible. So. <laughs> yeah. okay. Raven always wants to play this until the very end. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> This is another one um, that we just did in Performance Arcade um, in uh, set in um, shipping container Wellington. in Wellington. And um, it was all about, um, um, it's called Waiting Room. And um, it has um, the, the copper um, pendulums on the left are um, also smell dispensers, and they dispense the smells that are, relate to parosmia in um, COVID, um, other, otherwise known as um, smell distortion, where um, people smell really horrible smells after they've, um, some people have um, had COVID. And um, as part of the research I belong to, the GCCR, which is the Global Consortium of Chemosensory Research, which was um, um, going during the COVID pandemic to understand anosmia and parosmia and what was happening with the sense of smell in COVID. Um, and... Um, so, and the pendulums had roses on them that dropped their petals. Um, they're self-cleansing, known as self-cleansing roses, but the, the Rose Society that we collaborated with, they gave us fresh roses every day so that the, the rose petal, roses would just drop their petals all through the day, which was, a, you know, um, spoke about time. And you can talk about the, the double pendulum on the right-hand wall. Mm, there's, a, a, there's a picture of it working, isn't it? Yeah. So this is a... How do we find it? Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, the sound was made um, by the pendulums
was what was I what was I on crown? Oh, oh the, no, the pendulums were actuated by relay, a relay, Relays. in each one. That, that, um, the pendulum was actually hooked up to the motor, mm. and the yes. relay switched the motor backwards and forwards. And this thing here has all that wild movement. It's a well-known physics thing called the double pendulum. And it, uh, Apparently, it never does the same thing twice. Sort of fun making them. That's also how that works. It's got the um, the motor in the center, and there's an, an encoder which measures the position of the motor on the back, uh, connects it up to that same shaft. This is free spinning, the other one. And there's a little brain that, down the bottom that said something like, um, oh, start me moving, and then Every time I changed direction, give me a shove in the opposite direction, and it went backwards and forwards until it got fully winding. And then it said, um, let me go, turn the power off. And, and, it, and it would yeah. go, and then it would start again. And and the, the smells that were in the container were um would would were expressed one at a time and, and they were mold. Um, kitchen rubbish, like uh, overripe kind of awful rubbish, um, wet dog, and <clears throat> rose, but over the top rose, and um, I can't remember the other. Well, one. because it was an open <laughs> open container in Wellington, and there was wind. Yeah. Windy Wellington and the open and the container, but sometimes it was extremely powerful smell in there, and sometimes it was tolerable. Yeah. And this one oh. is our latest project, um, and it started out as this. Well, this was the read, the, the data, the um, Reading, reading the data and the reads, because there's the story of Midas, who was given ass's ears by Apollo for not saying the right thing, and the only and he tried to hide it. His hairdresser was the only one who knew. Hairdresser whispered it into a hole in the, the secret into a hole in the ground. Reeds grew and the wind rustled the reeds and they broadcast the secret. So this is an idea. This is getting the secret out of the reeds, and so yeah. Originally, it was about data. You can get data from anything, and it could damage you. S seditious words could be pulled out of thin air and cause yeah. you trouble. And so that's why I got that thing to come up and burn. Yeah, but we're not showing that that little oh, gadget here. Well, it doesn't but, matter. but it started out as uh, as Just wanting to show this make, kind of make thing it go, in, make it in, in the gallery. We we wanted to show to actually do this kind of thing in the gallery. And then we, we found that we couldn't because, there, you know, the fire regulations and so on, even though we were going to put it under a glass and so on, but pr produce <clears throat> produce these words on um, yes. FPOS paper and burn it. Um, that was how the words were going to be described. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, <clears throat> the words were going to be produced onto FPOS paper and then it would be burnt and um, that was the idea, the original idea from um, of but, Read Read. Yeah, but it was too hard to do. It was too it, hard to do. Too and, no, we could do it, but it was um, um, not able to be done in the gallery. So, so we um, had to rethink the whole thing and um, because the idea was was that um, it was the exposure of secrets, and when the reeds, when the, the hairdresser dug a hole in the earth and whispered a secret into it, and the reeds grew there and whispered it to the world. But um, then we were going to take the words and print them on FPOS paper, and then you know burn it, burn them. But it was it was an idea that evolved. 
a, um, over a couple of years, we did a residency at um, Lesnia in, in Gdansk. Um, and we've since, because, and then COVID happened, and then we couldn't do all sorts of things, and we had to make it into a an online work. Um, and since it's opened up, but we, we also um, did a lot of, I did a lot of research about Midas and uh, found that actually it wasn't such a myth um the, there was a um the the tomb of Midas um actually exists and it's in Turkey um and um the garments that were found in the tomb the mound Midas mound which was the the family tomb um was um they were covered in yellow gertite earth so um I managed to get some of this yellow gertite earth um, pigment and I painted the vest that you can see there. And then I also made an ochre perfume um, that is that, that fragrances the vest. So when you look at the um, work, you have the smell and you're immersed in the smell and the and you're wearing the same color as as um, Midas who um, as the what was left on Midas's garments, um, and of of the man who wanted to be the richest man in the world, and so the thing is about power and the hiding of secrets, Indeed. and what keeps them in place. And this is the this is the actual finished um, video of um, the words that are produced by the reeds that grew there in the hole. Yeah, so the letters, does it run? Mm. Oh, yeah. So anyway, the letters of, there's a laser here shooting across to a photo diode and the um, time the laser, the, the light is interrupted is measured in microseconds, and that, that number is using modular arithmetic turned into a range of letters from A to Z. And then they they appear here as they form, and they fall down into a um, they fall down into a um, well, it's an array of array of letters and form words. The the, the words are pre-programmed in. We did a lot of research on surveillance so, um... too, you know, because you can you can um, collect data from anything and make sense of it. Um, so, so you you um, just just by um, you know whichever algorithm or whichever presupposition you have. And um, and you could make sense of any sort of data. Yeah. You can you can look at the clouds in the sky and take data from them. You can look at the trees moving in the wind and take data and make sense of it. Well, make numbers of it. Yeah, make numbers of it, and then make letters ASCII code from from it. And so this, we filmed this over a day, so we had varying backgrounds and sky. I was sort of shooting, looking, yes, to, the, looking to the east. Yeah. And um, so it was all backflip, really. But anyway, that, that's what happens. It goes along like that. And then towards the end of the day, it got dark. You can sort of see the laser beam up there and the green, the green light is indicating the time the laser beam is either interrupted or not, I can't remember which. It's hard to explain it without without the 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 um explaining where it where the idea came from about Midas's hairdresser digging a hole in the soil and burying the secret in it, but how secrets were exposed by the reeds and the wind and the weather mm. and time.
<clears throat> and so you're immersed in the smell. The smell is um, of saffron. It, the, it's a yellow perfume or a yellow ochre perfume that I made. And it's a mixture of um, saffron, acacia, which are both brilliant yellow. You know, they they just are, and and um and also forty million year old amber, um, distilled. Mm -hmm. So which it gives it um a kind of a um a dark hydrocarbon edge. Yeah, this was the first time I tried a program called Processing, which is really good. So you can do things with images, moving images, and you can do things with text. And there's all these strings. There's strings of strings, strings of letters. Yeah. But you can manipulate them all in program in, pro in this program called Processing. Have a, have a lot of fun. <laughs> that way, <we're> fun. <laughs> I think Kim uses processing a lot in the installations that we do. So, oh. yeah, I got to really like it uh, actually. Once I got around, once I figured it out. So that was so that was yet another Arduino processing thing. That was, well, it was a different Arduino. It was a more super powerful high speed one to do the and the, the arithmetic. The words are um, about power. Yeah. And, mm. and, and subjugation. Mm. <clears throat> oh, is that it then for that one? Yeah, that's the end. Is that the end? That's us. Oh, yeah, that's what most wow. recently done. That's all we've done, really. Thank you. Well, that's all you've done. Well, thank you. <laughs> Sort of the right. understated end. Um, Raymond, can you un unshare the screen if that's all right, just so I can see you sure. both? Because I, I want to ask a couple of questions. We've got a little bit of time left, but I just want to ask a couple of quick questions. One of the things that comes out a lot in your respective practices is that you do a significant amount of research. Um, oh, yeah. you, and you, you research across a number of different dif disciplines, many of which you may not be familiar with to begin with, everything from sort of anthropology through to kind of um, sort of quite hard science, reading scientific papers, for example. Yes, yeah, so many. Do you think that, um, that good transdisciplinary practice necessarily involves research in that way? Well, um, I talked to Jill Scott um, years ago, who does artists and labs, and um, she said work with scientists otherwise you're dancing around the outside of the problem oh. and and i thought that was really really relevant so um i i worked with um richard newcomb in plant plant and food research and that really does you start realizing the materials that you're working with and the, and a different way of working with them and and you're looking, you're keeping within your own discipline, but you need to get your hands dirty with the other disciplines. And that is really hard because you're always standing on unknown ground. Um and 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 Brian is um he's working in a different discipline just by working with art because he has to consider all these other things yeah. as well. And and we're both like we're we're always learning so much stuff. But it's really important not to get too carried away with research for the sake of just doing all the research. Like it's really important to work with materials and work with your hands and to do a lot of experiments mm. and a lot of tests. Yeah. yeah. The other thing that, that, that's re that really informs you too. But, you know, to not just you could go years and years and years of research without doing any experiments. Yeah. Well, I was going to say the um, the other thing that in our work, what, what 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 we try and do is we try to make the thing and then we live with it for a while to see what it's like. Yeah. And see, because you know sometimes they're not quite what you expect and they can be improved. Like I wish we had a bit more time to do this last one to make the image certain aspects of the image could be improved and 
things like that. So you've got to have a, you've got to have a bit of time up your sleeve. Mm. Mm. Yeah, try it in different ways. And sometimes we do right angles and just go off in a completely other different direction. The first one that I showed you with the with the, all the coloured cake, mm. and it was all different flavours, and then the audience took them, whichever one they wanted, and ate it. It was to be consumed. Um, but we started out completely different to that. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that uh, the kind of practice that you do, and I guess we have resonances in our practice, not the same thing, but we also work across disciplines in what we do. Do you think that's supported in New Zealand? Because I notice a lot of, a lot of your projects seem to be residencies that you've done overseas or, or that you've done in um, exhibitions or in different other places. Do you think it's supported? Do you think it's getting better? What do you need? Do you think needs to happen to be better supported? What's your sense about that, both of you? Um, okay, <laughs> don't start me. But um, a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're outsiders, and um, the reason why we we um, show um, show works and and competitions and stuff here is to is to get the work shown. But um, um, also, like we had, we just had a work in the park and drawing prize and and. You know, performance research and uh, not performance, per performance arcade and so on. But but um, we're we're mainly outsiders. Um, what needs to happen? What I would love to see happen is for Creative New Zealand and other institutions to stop saying that they want works of excellence, that they want us to experiment is much more important because by experimenting we're going to move the culture forward mm. otherwise mm. If, if we are going for works of excellence um you know you, anyone can make a finished work that's already been you know it's already regurgitating um what's already been seen you know that doesn't really break new ground mm. Um, yeah, if if if, um, if we were more supported to make experiments, experimental, unfinished works, it would be a lot better. Mm. It's it, one of the what things we did um, deliberately in Plant Lab is all the things in there are, are works in progress. So the public comes in and sees people experimenting and that's the, in a way it's kind of the installation itself. It's people making their works because yeah. it, we're so attuned, I think, locally to going to numerous gallery exhibitions where people have delivered a work, but you don't actually see A, the process behind it, but it also for me, it, it creates an outcome driven arts culture not a process driven supporting the practice culture it's it's not actually supporting process or reflection on process or or the collaboration as a performance slash process in of itself and i think one of the ways you and i have always i think you and i have clicked is uh, you and i love the process and we also love being in community and having that kind of raw experience of doing stuff <laughs> whether it works or not uh, in kind of those in those in those raw settings, even if the posh things that you go to later are really great. For me, I love the most. I love community settings where you have random things happen that aren't always necessarily awesome, but they're really great learning. You know what I mean? And you can't have that when you're in a in a kind of semi posh cloistered gallery setting or a, yeah. even a residency that's highly controlled. I think. I, but I think also um, you you can have both. You can have you can have the experimenting, which is highly supported. For example, um, Arts Hub in Australia supports experimentation for street art, for all sorts of public art, and so on. And then they get brilliant things. You know, they get they get really jaw dropping stuff, which is wonderful. And uh, um, unless that kind of risk taking is supported, we'll just be getting the same old stuff. Yeah, well, the same old stuff. I can oh, cool. I can say 
categorically to both of you is not what you do, which is the main reason why I invited you, because I see you as kind of leading figures in New Zealand around this kind of practice and very inspirational to me and many of the people who are going to be watching. Um, I'm conscious of time, but uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be many more opportunities to hear in depth about what both of you do, because there's resonance, resonances with many of the practices up here. Um, but for first of all, I just want to thank you both for giving your time and sharing your practice with us. Um, thank Ministry of Culture and Heritage, who in this instance did have supported some um, some interesting, innovative practice in New Zealand, and to Zoom webinars who are supporting these webinars so that we can get um, some of these inspirational interviews out to different communities so people can learn about what people who are working I guess the margins, but also in between, are doing. So, yeah, thank you. Is anything final you want to add or anything at all? Well, I would say thanks to the film industry for, for allowing me to keep a workshop going and um, do all the stuff, really. <laughs> That's, yeah. As if I didn't have that to, to make it all, I couldn't run, I couldn't do it otherwise. I wouldn't have the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're um, and, and, um, Brian having that allows us to be pretty independent mm. Mm. Um, yeah. of institutions and mm. and funding and and all of that sort of stuff. Even though you know we um, most of our funding applications fail, but <laughs> but but we do get residencies and and um, exhibitions and stuff. Yeah, and and we make we manage to make the work. Yeah, so it is really good. It's really fantastic having workshop, workshop yeah. and equipment, mm. hey, and, and your expertise. Mm. Well, I, mean, I think there's, there's there's another discussion to be had about how to be sustainable and work on the margins, but I think that's for another day. But yeah. um, but, but, but thank you both again for your time, and you. um, and look forward to doing some um, potential collaborations as we go along. Yep. Thank you very much, Maggie.